once the beta test, and it's been well tested. Uh, it's been developed through some of the folks here that Craig Johnson has brought to the table, and it's truly a course resolution. Um, we're looking for objective structure and management, and that, and and what information we get there. And John will cover more of that. And Amy will then go into a, a, a more finer resolution, objective point land cover validation data entry system that's uh, uh, a very user friendly drop down uh, platform that uh, we want to see if it provides some of those elements that John's been using and maybe combine those for a uh, uh, further development by our partnership. And then we'll take a short break at 930 for, for any uh, biological needs, but uh, also uh, after that we'll open it up for uh, a facilitated discussion on inventory objectives, source versus fine filters, uh, the objective management or species conservation, our composition, the, uh, if we are looking at species diversity or are we just looking at structure for management purposes. Identify those required fields that meet common objectives, uh, grassland inventory data entry, what is the agency organization objective? And then determine and identify those inventory items as essential, those that are limited in value, and those that may not be needed at all that we can avoid and exclude. Um, before I turn it over to John, uh, is there any other elements on the agenda that we would like to refine or clarify? And it's an open mic time, so feel free to speak up. So, Bill, this is uh, Woody. So, uh, did you uh, was this uh, this this particular webinar was a select group of people, or do you want? I know you're going to repeat repeat it possibly, because I know there's some other folks that would benefit by uh, by participating. We we selectively identified who we wanted here, Woody. We wanted people who had actually collected uh, a significant amount of information on grasslands and grassland inventory efforts. So we can talk to those people directly who have had a great deal of experience in platforming this information uh, before we go out to a broader audience of stakeholders because okay. All right, we wanted you. to focus on, on on a productive discussion of what is what is what do we have in common and what do we have that's different that we can avoid. That gotcha. that conflict. Thank you. And it will be taped. We will be able to bring this this effort to a broader audience as as we move forward. Any other questions from folks uh, on the phone? Just a quick quick update: where this came from. We started out with talking about grassland inventories in 2011. It was a high priority. Uh, to develop a decision support tool, something that would help us through spatial analysis and, and a broader application understand where our priorities are for grassland conservation. And we had a face to face discussion, facilitated discussion in February of 2013 that refined that effort and uh, that resulted in, in several uh, additional efforts here at the Wetland Center as well as a project that. Uh, Dave Diamond and MORAP and his associates, Lee Elliott and others, are working on with the Grassland Decision Support Tool, the workshops that were hosted last May. Um, and if Pat or Patrick Chris, Pat Comer or Patrick Chris are on the phone, they're uh, deeply involved in this, and, and we want to see uh, these next steps as an inventory to, uh, to possibly look at where we go in the future. Um, and we want to use these presentations today as examples of inventory systems in use, determine specific required data, describe 
I'm going to turn it over to John uh, to cover his presentation and then Amy. And after Amy is finished uh, with Q&A through their presentations, somewhere around 9.30, quarter to 10, we'll take a short five-minute break and then we'll go into a facilitated discussion. So, so uh, John, we're going to turn the, uh, the uh, presentation over to you. And while John's connecting with the uh, with his presentation, are there any other questions from folks on the phone? Alright. Can you guys hear me fine? We hear you fine here in the uh, Wetland Center. Is everybody on the phone? Can they hear John? Yep. I can hear you, John. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. All right, well, I appreciate uh I think I'm part of the reason why this this webinar got made a little at a little earlier time. I got to get on the road to beautiful Buda, Texas in a little while and so uh, I'm going to give this webinar I'm going to stay on the phone and, and hopefully be part of the conversation and be part of and and, and listen to Amy's presentation but uh won't be able to stick around in the webinar. Uh so to start, uh uh, what we're talking about is this, what, what Bill asked me to talk about is this grassland management inventory tool, which was uh, developed by uh, Craig's crew at the uh, USGS Advanced Ass Lab there in Lafayette and uh, was uh, developed with input from uh, basically the, the three bird joint ventures in, uh, uh, in, in, in our region, in the LCC. Uh, the, the name is something that I've been made fun of quite quite frequently for because I like to make acronyms and I don't know why I'd make so many acronyms but it's a probably a pretty awful title for this thing but the GMIT works for us um, and if I was a little more creative we'd have something flashy but uh, so uh, in in developing the, the basic idea which Bill talked about is a you know a shared uh, a platform for all of us to collect the, the common information we need to, to help us do a better job of, of picking the right grassland areas to work uh, uh, and, uh, and what sort of data to collect regarding those grassland areas. Um, uh, we started to you know put stuff on paper and say what all we needed to collect and it became pretty clear that you can go down a lot of different roads when, when you start thinking about inventory and grasslands and, and so we had to kind of dial it back uh, and, and start with uh, really thinking about uh, what exactly we wanted to, to have this thing do for us. So we spent a lot of time, when I say we, I mean the mostly the staff from the, the joint ventures that I mentioned, uh, spent a lot of time uh, thinking about what exactly we want this thing to do and we, we wanted to articulate that uh, and have those things, put those things down on paper. So I want to give those as kind of an example and where we're coming from and, and hopefully it'll it'll make clear why we pick certain attributes that we pick. So uh, first off, we want to con quantify contribution of enrolled tracks toward JV grass on habitat objectives at whatever spatial scale those objectives exist. Uh, so simple idea, when we're delivering grass on projects, uh, we want to know uh, how those are contributing to uh, uh, our habitat objectives. So we need to know what kind of habitat they provide uh, specifically for grass and birds. Pretty simple idea, but it's something we all we all know in our field we tend to uh, uh, kind of uh, gloss over quickly. Uh, we wanted to analyze contribution of glass, grassland fracks to existing or future JV objectives using minimum block size thresholds or contigu contiguity fragmentation, so that's multiple rules that exist or are yet to be determined. So uh, basically the same as above, but we wanted to be able to look at uh, uh, patch size and proximity and uh, be able to determine what impact, have a means of, of uh, uh, have, a, have a collected data set when we start to look at what impact those might have on populations that we're monitoring. Uh, provide a potential sample frame for research regarding the relationship between grass and management practices and available habitat types. So when we're trying to improve our models about uh, uh, what practices, well, before we get to the modeling birds, what practices result in what habitat it's good to have a record of what practices we did in the resulting vegetation. Uh, and then when we want to move from that habitat type that was achieved to the impact on grass and bird populations, uh, we need to know again uh, that the, the vegetation in those areas and, 
and, uh, and then link that to our grass and bird population monitoring. And then uh, we also envisioned uh, uh, the ability to use this to provide sites that can be used for ground truthing of landscape level grassland remote sensing assessments. Now I know that's some of the area of expertise a lot of folks in this room and on this call and uh, and uh, in all honesty it wasn't the expertise of the folks that that uh, uh, were sitting around developing this thing. So uh, we kind of thought well maybe some of these attributes might inform that uh, but I think definitely that's an area where uh, we can be uh, schooled and told what, what better to, to include in this so we can actually have something that be worthwhile to the to that sort of effort. And then obviously when we're uh, reporting for uh, whoops, we're reporting, reporting for different grants or, or things or different programs we need to be able to uh, uh, tell our, our funders or our, our parent organizations uh, some actual numbers we need to be able to develop uh, reports from this thing you know acres, practices, uh, habitat achieves that sort of stuff. So those were our objectives and for each so what we did for each one of these objectives we came up with a list of okay what do we need for that? What attributes do we need to collect? Um, and you know obviously we start at the top with and these are in, in order of priority, you know really it's to us it's about uh, for our particular purposes about grass and bird habitat. And so uh, we need to know what components of a given parcel uh, are important for us to include when we're describing its suitability for grass and bird habitat. And so what we came up with, uh, along with, with some other kind of general things, are, are a list of, of veg and management attributes that uh, we know are important for grass and bird habitat. So uh, along with, you know, general identifiers and, and background information. Uh, we wanted to know what, how tall the grass was. And of course we know that, you know, these are pretty, that's kind of a, an ephemeral attribute, but we're going to have, for our idea is to have this in uh, particular project areas, have this data collected at a standard time every year, uh, hopefully annually. So we'll start to, to get a pretty good idea of the, the uh, how that manager is managing their, their grass. Um, uh, but bunch grass clumps per acre, uh, another one where we've had a lot of questions about kind of the, the ability to collect that data in a standardized way. Uh, it's kind of a common thing you hear about in quail uh, uh, habitat uh, uh, suitability sort of evaluations and, and that's something we use but maybe something we need some, some thought into for our data collection the best way to do it. Uh, we need to know about food sources, we need to know, uh, uh, I guess I might have highlighted these, there we go. We need to know uh, bare ground that it exists. We know it's important for, for quail and other grass and birds. Uh, we also want to know the, the uh, sort of threat we're getting as far as exotic grass is concerned. So certain areas of the state we're dealing with this more than others, but uh, that's going to be a big component of how we manage these grasslands. And then uh, we all know woody shrub coverage for grass and birds is important. Uh, so we want the percent woody shrub coverage, but we also need to know the distribution. And, and that was one that's tough to, to get a handle on too. There's certain, there's, a, there's scores you can give for interspersion, uh, but we actually went with, the, to really simplify it, is, uh, I don't have these in this presentation, but uh, diagrams that show either uh, scattered, clustered, uh, perimeter, uh, uh, linear uh, kind of arrangements of, of brush. And uh, with that combined with the, the percent woody shrub coverage, we hope we get a good idea of the brush uh, coverage out there. And then the availability of loggerhead shrike, perch trees, loggerhead shrike is a uh, priority species for both the oaks and prairies in the Gulf Coast Joint Venture. And, uh, uh, and so that's the one attribute that everything else uh, was kind of overlapping, but that was the one, one attribute for that one bird that, that was important that we didn't have in there. So we threw that in there as well. And then uh, management attributes, basically the, the four uh, uh, tools, you know, Leopold's tools of the, you know, the axe, the cow, the plow, the fire, and the gun. Leave out the gun here, but uh, cows, grazing, uh, some, some information about the management that's going on, uh, burning, uh, how fire is being used, uh, brush management, and, uh, and native grass reseeding. Uh, those are all the things that we fund through our grass and restoration incentive program. And then uh, we wanted to make sure, speaking to that objective that we that I mentioned at the end, being able to report this to 
uh, the, the powers that be, we wanted to make sure we could uh, assign uh, attributes to, to uh, 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 program attributes to each of these project areas so we can actually show some, some, uh, some re de develop reports with some real numbers for, for showing folks for reporting. So that's it for this attributes part. Now I'm going to go through and do a, uh, uh, a demo of the actual system. But this might be a point, while I bring this up, this, this might be a point to, if anybody has any questions about those specific uh, uh, objectives or attributes, I'd, I'd be happy to, to entertain them. OK, easy enough. All right, so when you want to visit the Grass and Management Inventory tool, you uh, uh, first you navigate to this particular login page. Uh, now I know uh, Craig's in the room there in, in Lafayette, and he'll definitely be a better source of, uh, you know, the the I guess the the tech side of this stuff. I'm not a I'm not a programmer. I'm not a, a computer guy. I just fumble around with it. But uh, uh, if, you know, questions about uh, uh, programming things, I'll I'll defer to, to Craig. But uh, basically, we have a, a login page. So I've got a username, and I think I'm just one of a few people with a username at this point, and I've got my password. So I log into the system. Uh, not now. And it's I'm logging in as uh, under a certain user role. Uh, so there's a there's a help uh, uh, window there. I'm logging in under a certain user role, which uh, uh, we can uh, have the ability uh, to assign different user roles to different agencies and organizations that are using this. Right now we have a TPWD one just kind of as a placeholder that I'm under. Um, when I log into that, I will be able to see all the other projects under my user role. Uh, or I can click this button up here and only show the polygons that I as the user put in there. So you're looking at the the basic system now and it's it's uh we think it's pretty pretty clean and pretty pretty easy to navigate, pretty nice looking. Uh when we're looking at this map, there's a couple of things we can we can change to based on our preferences of what we want to see. Uh we can show uh you know wildlife refuge boundaries. We can show national forests and parks. It's loading but we should jump up. There we go. We've got some of these Sam Houston Prairie Chicken Refuge. I'm showing right now the area I work primarily, just for ease of presentation. Um, and then we can we can decide what what are the things we want the map to show. We can we can have highways on there and those sort of things. And then we can we can change what our base map's going to be. So if you'd rather work with imagery in uh, or the topo map that it starts with. And then if we just want light gray, this one kind of works well for starting to see different uh, uh, parcels. So these are all these little dots in here. You can see my mouse are the, the polygons where are our particular projects. I'm going to put it on imagery for now. And so to the, the really the, the main functional, well, let's see, what some of these other things we have. So we have a measure tool uh, that allows you to measure uh, select the draw a polygon and measure the area, uh, measure distances, and then uh, give you a location, uh, which you know we know is is useful for a lot of different different things and different, uh, especially different grants are putting in. People want to know where the things are, where they're spending money. Uh, also, once we have uh, uh, polygons input into the system, we can download those shape files to be manipulated in uh, uh, GIS or view. So let's take a particular area and, and demonstrate kind of the, the main functionality that we use this for. So right now here's the showing the, the green Atwater Prairie Chicken National Wildlife Refuge. Um, show these these uh, uh, yellow tan polygons are uh, project areas that we have that we're funding with the Grass and Restoration Incentive Program. I'm willing to show these to you now because there's nothing uh, in theory that's identifying about those. Uh, and so uh, we don't have any personal information attached to them either. So 
if I want to put a new polygon in, let's say I'm working with this landowner up here. Pretty simple. I'm going to right click, give me a choice to create a feature. And I'm going to start drawing. I'm just clicking to, to place a point, or a corner. And once I feel good about it, I double click and it's going to finish the that last leg of it. So there I've got my polygon. Now what automatically comes up, you see this pane over here changed, and here's where we assign the attribute. So uh, uh, we want a date for when the survey was conducted. It's taken today. We'll leave it at that. Um, the unit name, we use uh, uh, numerical identifiers for ours, so we'll just say this is 001. Observer name is myself. And the county, this is Colorado County. Notice also I calculated an acreage down here. Now vegetation, this is these are the attributes that I, I mentioned earlier. So um and each of them have a little help an icon here that i tell you exactly what we're talking about. So height in inches of dominant herbaceous canopy cover type during nesting season. So obviously that's there's there's quite a bit of, of variability one could find in, in the, the responses uh to this general prompt if if that's what somebody's looking to do. But what we're gonna our our goal is to uh make sure that we have a standard protocol that kind of limits some of that variability of what people are putting in here. Um, but but we definitely uh, uh, are open to suggestions of how best to do that and how we can we can better improve these fields. Um, right now, basically, it's just me collecting this data uh, for these different projects and our project managers who we're working closely with. So it's kind of a tight knit group, and right now uh, we haven't had to really open it up to uh, to to a wider community. So range of vegetation height, say it's eight inches. A uh, bunch of grass clumps per acre, 250 is a good number. Uh, four of abundance and variety. What we said here was uh, uh, how many species of suitable food plants for quail are av available on representative sample of the parcel. Once again, a lot of uh, the variability in there, our standard protocol that we're working on developing, will hopefully clear that up. But we'll say a dozen different food plants, percent bare ground, uh, 25 is a good number for us. Percent exotic grass coverage, hopefully zero. Percent woody shrub coverage, uh, uh, we'll say 25. Woody shrub distribution. Well, here's where we had uh, came up with our diagrams to show what the distribution is like. We're going to say scattered. And there are available longer edge strike perches. So. Oh, and I didn't I didn't include the we could also go to management. Uh I guess it did. So I can go to management now and put in the grazing operation. When last brush management treatments were done, when last native grass receding treatments were done. And then assign a program to it. Put OPJV grip. Uh, and so basically that's about it. Um what we're left with is a collection of of shape files that we can download and, and have to manipulate. Um, when you hover over a particular shape file, it will, uh, I think, yeah, it'll tell you what we have for it. And those attributes will fill the attribute table of the shape file when you download it. Uh, so, Bill, I think that's about it for me. Okay. Um, while we're transitioning to Amy, is there any questions for John uh, and and how that uh, how that system worked? Any questions about the attributes that they collected? Well, uh, this is Woody. I, ha I have a couple of questions. So, uh, do you have? Do you? You know, we know that. Based upon the one thing, the loggerhead shrike is one of the species that you looked at. What are the what are the other species that you? Yeah, good. Uh, I probably should have said that. Um, so 
when I say our grassland bird species, I'm talking about the identified focus species for the Oaks Prairie's Gulf Coast and the Rio Grande Joint Venture. Um, I only work partially with the with the Gulf Coast and in, in, in Rio Grande, so I can't necessarily speak to their species list right off the top of my head, but I know ours includes uh, you know, a pretty it's a pretty long list of about uh twenty uh breeding and wintering grass and bird species. Uh, you know, obviously Bob White's at the top of that list, but um uh let's see, Eastern Meadowlark, Longer Edge Trikes is Yeah, I mean you don't have to go through, through but twenty that that's nope. I mean you, you you explain that. And then uh, another yeah. question I have is so uh, do you have all the vegetation information, but do, do you have any, uh, do y'all ever do any bird surveys? Yeah, so so at the same time we're doing, we're actually starting our third year this year of uh, uh, focused grass and breeding bird surveys, and we do fall covey call count in some of these areas. Um, uh, so yeah, so so we're we're collecting that data at the, the county level, uh, and and the hope is that to start to make some of those connections between uh, uh, acres on the ground and, and population changes, uh, but but what we see is a, a the future kind of, of of this data set in particular is to be able to go to those real specific areas, those field level areas, and we have a, a you know a sampling frame now of where the projects are, and we can go in there and do some uh, real localized bird surveys to see the impact and to help us then inform our modeling efforts. Um, uh, so that's kind of a, in the future. We're doing a little bit of that now with our uh, National Bob White Conservation Initiative focus area, but uh, uh, but right now our our uh, our breeding our, our breeding season surveys are our county level surveys throughout Texas and Oklahoma. And then uh, uh, for the uh, uh, for your management drop down list, do you have anything for like you know uh, like fire ant management or is that you have that as a category? Uh, no. So, uh, so yeah, you could do fire ants. You could do uh, a predator control. You could do uh, even harvest strategy stuff for a lot of those game species in particular. Uh, no, we left those off because we wanted to do uh, uh, strictly habitat and veg. And I, you know, you can make the make the case for fire ants in there, um, but you know, we without. Well, having some better information and you know to be able to wrap our minds around that as a as an issue on the landscape we uh we didn't put that in there um so yeah okay any, any questions for John before we uh in Amy's presentation Amy, can you share your desktop sure. It's always fun to be on WebEx as it's sharing and, and working together like we all should. So, Hang on. And you see the Packers. Yep. <laughs> can you all hear me? We can hear you here. Everybody out there, can you hear Amy fine? Yeah, you're good, Amy. Okay, good. So I was going to talk um, a little bit about our methodology for the new state veg map for Texas um, and how we collected field data there. Uh, go through that, um, discuss some of the pros and cons, and then sort of propose a field data form for grassland inventories. Um, so let me jump right into our goals were a little different than John's. Um, we were trying to ground truth the entire state of Texas, so covering a diversity of land cover types, landforms, and plant communities. Um, we needed to collect a large amount of data in a pretty short time frame. Um, and like John, we were looking for accuracy and consistency in data collection. So we were also using electronic field data forms um, and pull down lists to sort of manage some of that. Uh, the data was applied um, both to inform the remote sensing model and to QAQC, the final map, um, and also help us develop descriptions for ecological systems. So when I say a lot of field data, I'm talking 14,000 field data points, um, most of them collected by me um, in 398 different map types or different habitat types. So kind of give you the scope of what we did and I think this is pretty similar to what we want to accomplish with grasslands. So um, while not the diversity in landforms, you um, have the diversity in landscape. 
Looks like you need a field trip to the Panhandle. Oh, yeah, I should mention that, huh? That was done. We did collect field data up there, but I did not do that area. So it was collected with other funds um, and by other field data workers. So um, there is data for that, but just not by me. Um, how did we do this? Texas is mostly private land, so a lot of the field data was collected roadside. Um, we used a GPS, a Trimble GPS connected to my um, laptop in the, in the vehicle. Uh, site selection was sort of done ahead of time. Um, one, it needed a road. And two, we tried to collect data in um, a diversity, again, of landscape types. So I'd look at um, NAPI aerial photographs, satellite imagery, uh, soil maps, and try to actually spend my day hitting a bunch of different types. Uh, our plots needed to be larger than the 30 meter satellite sig signature, so we were looking at a visual 50 by 50 meter um, plot. Um, unless we hit rare plant communities, so things like swales, potholes, um, and riparian corridors. Um, and we, again, collected our data digitally directly into ArcMap. And I'll try to toggle to ArcMap and see how it works. It wasn't cooperating this morning, but we'll try in a minute. Um, we collected all of our samples at one mile in intervals, again, except for rare systems. I would stop, collect a sample on one side of the road uh, data point, and then one on the other side of the road. Um, the pros of, of this is we could collect a whole lot of data, um, and there's road access everywhere, right? Um, problems we ran into were things like edge effect, so sometimes there's tree lines in the way you can't see. Um, you get the road edge effect, um, and we had to rely very heavily on having my laptop with an aerial photograph to sort of determine the homogeneity of the sample I was collecting. Um, as the project moved forward, we started getting more access to private lands, uh, more accessibility on public lands, um, and it allowed us to sort of collect more soil and land cover types um, across the state. The only problems with private land work is you are limited for access and time. There's less roads. Um, it, it is a lot more time consuming. You can, however, collect a lot more data, um, and you're more likely to encounter some of the rare systems we mapped. This is a screenshot of what our field data form looks like. Um, and again, I'll, I'll talk to ArcMap to show you how it works. Um, but we collected a sample date, the person collecting the data. Each data point would get a site ID, and then we'd take a photograph. Um, in the field, the photograph gets the number on the camera. Um, when you come by, you come back to the office, you kind of reconcile both those numbers. Um, outside of proofing the data, that's um, the really only other time consuming after data entry in the field, so that's kind of nice. Uh, classified into an ecological system, which is ecosystem name. Um, express some sort of level of confidence in that um, call, and then assign a land cover type. Um, and then estimate cover in that 50 by 50 meter plot. So these are um, of the ve major vegetation strata. So how much woody percent cover, broadleaf evergreen percent cover, needle leaf evergreen, tree, shrub, and herb. Um, and these are in classes, um, pretty common classes, 0 to 5%, 6 to 25, 26 to 50, um, 51 to 75, and 76 to 100. Um, and then actually identify the top three dominants in each of the vegetation strata, so trees, shrubs, and herbs. And I'm going to try to get ArcMap to work so I can show you how this looks in the field. Right. So this is sort of what phase two field data snapshot of what it looks like. Um, the good thing is you can bring as many data layers along with you in ArcMap on your laptop as you have um, storage capacity for. So I'd often bring the soils maps, the aerial photographs, um, public lands boundaries. And you can see the difference on public lands, how data is collected, sort of clustered, less land access versus roads where it's a little more spread out. Um, try to access one of these data points. So that's what happens in the field when you start collecting data. Um, 
field form pops up. Driving along the road, stop every mile. Field form pops up, and put my data point off the road. You can also measure to make sure you're getting a 50 by 50 meter area um, that's pretty consistent. You're not hitting the fence line or uh, different management. Date, um, you can enter your name. There's a scroll down list of field workers. Data point, scroll down list of plant community types. Um, your confidence in the call, uh, your land cover type, um, and then all of the percent cover types have pulled down. So it's pretty easy. Um, coastal Bermuda field would take about two minutes to classify. Um, a natural community, 15 minutes. Uh, so again, a whole lot of data in a pretty short period of time. Let me go back to my presentation, see if I can get it to work. Ah. So that's, again, what it looks like in the field or in ArcMap. You have a photograph, your field data point, and your attribute table. Pretty simple, quick and dirty, whole lot of data. Um, sort of how I see this can work for grassland data um, and the minimum amount, amount we can collect, and I'm definitely open to suggestions with this, um, is to do a windshield survey. Um, and collect some similar attributes and adding sort of more vegetation data. So the thing about grasslands, as we know, is they're variable. They vary by season. They vary by land management and recover pretty quickly. Um, this is sort of the field data form I was proposing and working on for grasslands, um, collecting similar sort of data, land cover data, um, incorporating maybe a management class, uh, bare ground and form, um, and then collecting percent cover by class for species. So one of the things, feedback we got and complaints is you couldn't tell things that were extremely dominant. So let's say you have King Ranch blue stem in your list. is if it's listed as the first grass, is it 90% of the grass? Is it 10%? Um, so I think incorporating this would be uh, of use. Um, and in an electronic form, you could have, if you entered county, oops, you could have county list of species pop up. All these are downloadable from USDA plants. Um, And again, all of these would be pull downs. And I think it would be useful to have either a scientific name field and a common name field for those folks not as familiar with scientific names. Um, other options, of course, would be line transects, belt transects, meter plots, five meter plots. Unfortunately, all of those require, as we know, a lot of land access. Um, time and knowledge regarding both vegetation and how to sample that vegetation. Um, with that, I am definitely open to questions and suggestions on the grassland form. Um, if you want, I can pull that back up. Any, any comments? Maybe this, this is Woody again. Yes. So, if I understand, could you like could you back up a little bit? Sure. And you were these data that you collected mm -hmm. uh, were field truthing. They're field truth data points. Right. right. Uh, so that's all. That all relates back to the the vegetation map. Right. That you're you're going out and and basically confirming. So this uh, was before the map. So, before yeah. the map. Right. So 50% of the data actually was used to inform the remote sense model land cover set, right? Oh, okay. And then the other 50% of the data was used to QAQC the model to look at how accurate are we, right? And then we also used all of that vegetation data, all these species data, 
to um, assist us in descriptions of map types, right? Okay. So Texas is sort of poorly described in certain areas when it comes to vegetation. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, so this is Dave. And just before John left, I wanted to to make the comment that, you know, John's uh, data collection is really related to a track or management unit um, ownership. Most of the data are are directed toward characterizing the the whole whole track and um, the management of the track and. Um, Amy's stuff is more directed at collecting a lot of data over a broad area of uh, which you would need to, um, to really do remote sensing, to, to be useful for remote sensing and characterize a larger area. But you could, you could almost uh, use her data collection form and method for the vegetation attributes part of the um, of yours, or modify it and use it, you know, within that module of of John's you know, overall form. You know what I mean, John? Yeah, I, I do. And what you're what you're saying about and sorry if this is not loud. I'm driving right now. What you're saying about uh, being tracked and management based is, is absolutely right. And I mean that's you know it's in the title, right? It's the grassland management inventory tool. Um, uh, yeah, and I I do think that that. Uh, uh, some standardization of us collecting those veg attributes, and what, what at least I can hear from what Amy's put together there, it does sound like there's a lot of, a lot of opportunity for, for kind of some, some common protocol. Um, I do know though that uh, the, uh, we are a little, we, we have the luxury of being having access to the properties where we have projects. So we are hoping to have a little more than just what you can see from the roadside, you know, in particular being able to say, you know, measure, measure veg height, uh, you know, actually get to look at bare ground, some of those things. So, um, uh, so maybe there's, you know, a, a protocol for a, a windshield side of the road survey, and maybe there's a protocol for, for a, you know, pick and dirt survey. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, but the same attributes could be collected by everybody. Um, the same minimum set of attributes. Um, it, you just have to add the veg height, and uh, Amy did add bare ground, but and then then the clumps per unit area could also be added as a right. potential field to to collect. But you know, I, I think what she's got, you would need pretty much anyway. Uh, but there are like three or four things that you're collecting that's not on her form. And there right. are several, several things that she's collecting that's not on John's form because it's more species specific. But basically, they're quite similar, really. Right. And John, some of the things I collect, I think, would be just a different way to estimate your things, like bunch grass per acre or shrub clumps per acre. Um, it's just a different way to look at it um, by species instead of without assigning species names. And, and that, I definitely think there's some, some ability for us to refine what we've got in there uh, uh, if, if that's the case. Because basically we just said, you know, what do we want to know? And that's what drove it. We didn't necessarily approach it from what what can we collect and we're just hoping to, to kind of well, it came with like that, so we're hoping to kind of, you know, bridge that gap now. Right. So are you actually... So how, uh, when you all, did you all consider or think about, uh, like, disturbance as a, like, historic disturbance? And I guess I'm thinking more on the coastal plains, such as, like, land leveling or not. Did you all think about uh, trying to capture that? In grasslands? No, not really. Um, it's difficult to capture when you're doing a remote sense model. Um, I was just is, thinking about like presence of pimple mounds or not, you know. That right, kind of and I think that could be incorporated in a in a grassland tool, but I don't think it was doable for a statewide tool, you know. Sure. 
and for us, Woody, we we thought about you know having something in there about historic land use or something like that, but but then again, we're talking snapshot forward and it's tough to know, especially when you got changing ownerships and those sort of things. What did happen there, and without it being trained and identifying, you know, those geologic kind of conditions, uh, you know, we thought that might be a, a little beyond what we were trying to do. Well, and it, and it may not be applicable through the whole, you know, it's definitely not applicable to the whole state. So, but it's uh, you know, for the coastal coastal plain area, it's a, it's a nice attribute to know. Right. Let me, uh, this is Bill Bardish. I, just to uh, take a little bit more facilitated approach, um, uh, we had two specific presentations, one by John and one by Amy, and I'd like to tease out any questions that, that might be direct, directly related to what they presented and why, because we're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about what can we do in addition, what can we do collectively, and, and how do we identify the most important elements over the next hour? Uh, and I'd like to give the opportunity for some folks to speak up that have been on the phone that haven't that haven't had a chance yet. And I'd, I'd, I'd like to, you know, Bill, just tell me shut up. I would, Amity and Chris Reed, uh, are, are you? Uh, are there any questions? that you have from the perspective of the Louisiana Department of Wildlife, any any of the methodology that you see is uh, you have a question about? Um, sort of. It sounds like what we're trying to do here, we have two different inventory methods. We're trying to maybe harvest the, the, most, the, the best parts of both and come up with something specific to the LCC. Is that the objective here? Yeah, and, and I think from your perspective, Chris, uh, you have some very specific inventory methods in place. Is is there anything similar or anything uh, that you believe is 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 uh, unnecessary from your your point of view? Well, the quantitative work that we're doing in prairies is, is research related, so it's much more intensive than mm -hmm. uh, for inventory purposes. The inventory side of things is more about um, a. Uh, it's more qualitative. Just a, a competent botanist goes in the field, evaluates habitat, basically uh, assigns a rank from uh, 1 to 10, 10 being the best, and, and collecting qualitative field notes. Uh, we haven't incorporated um, kind of a, a moderately intensive or low intensity um, quantitative protocol for inventory purposes at present. Okay. Uh, Larry, you had a, a question. I, I have a comment. Uh, well, uh, from the plant community standpoint, uh, not, not so much a bird habitat standpoint, uh, floral quality is, is uh, uh, from a conservation and restoration standpoint, is our greatest interest. And I think it aligns pretty well with the heritage program's uh, interest. And floral quality is determined by, by a species list, which is what getting at, which takes uh, botanical skill, but Amy's list comes closest to, uh, to giving useful information for us. Uh, you mentioned site history and site disturbance. That can be uh, uh, indirectly determined from, from a, a species list, not even a complete mm -hmm. list of dominance. And, uh, the difference between using a paper form and an electronic form is a real contrast for me. Uh, and uh, you're really limited with a paper form. Uh, the, the other thing is the difference between roadside uh, you know, uh, characterization and, and standing in the area. One of the problems I have with John's form is that everything's based on an acre. I grew up on a farm, and I can tell you no two people see the same area as an acre. So a, a smaller area would make sense to be in. And Chris Reed actually suggested uh, uh, a fifth of an acre, which is a 53-foot radius. You stand in the center. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you can't, if, you, if you're doing it from the roadside, then Amy's 50-meter by 50-meter plots make perfect sense, much more so than an acre, and you can extrapolate up from that. Um, but uh, uh, I, I think that you could come up with a combination of the two forms that would that that, uh, that I would be very happy with. Uh, 
any anyone else here in the in the room want to make a comment? Uh, I was going to ask, uh, put you on the spot, Rich and Charlotte, uh, from TNC's point of view. Did you see anything that uh, you wanted to uh, question or, or clarify? I don't really have any uh, comments at this point, Bill, uh, so I'll defer to Charlotte if she has anything. So we'll, uh, we're right at 930, and uh, I, I would like to verify if, if there's anyone else on the line that we haven't uh, put on a roll. Uh, if anyone's joined us that hasn't identified herself, so we can make sure you have some input today. Um, any any other additional folks on the line? Hey, Bill. This is Jaime Gonzalez from Houston. I, I'm joining you late. I'm sorry. I got caught in another meeting. That's fine. That's fine. We we are taping this, and we'll be able to rerun it at some point. But uh, oh, great, uh, great. Any anything you've heard, Jaime, that uh, that you wanted to uh, ask a question about? Not not yet. I just I just really just joined you guys. I'm going to be looking forward okay. to seeing this again. Okay. Um, let's uh, unless we've got someone that wants to ask a quick question, let's take about a five minute break. presentation from our discussions earlier. Are you there? Yeah, Bill, I'm here. No, I, I didn't really have any questions on either presentations or the methodologies for putting that information into those uh, those inventories and, and definitely understand the differences between the two. You know, I'm, I'm just listening in to, to see how you know, we could possibly provide some information from a from a private landowner perspective or maybe even some of the projects that we do on public lands. And then, you know, I do have in the back of my mind the potential for this to be maybe a component of it for citizen science. If, 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 if folks was willing and thought it would be a good idea to turn some portions of it over to, to volunteer folks like master naturalists who could input a lot of information. Obviously, there's probably some goods and some bads with that, but, but it's just a thought that's kind of rattling around in my head. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's, um, there's quite an effort going on at OU right now with Climate Science Center to tie photographs to uh, current conditions, believe it or not, worldwide, but they're, they're focused on North America primarily right now, but they're, they're looking at how to validate conditions on the ground through photographic, uh, 360 degree photographic validation. It's uh, kind of an interesting concept. Uh, but uh, I also, Jesus, I, I failed to check in with you to see if you had any uh, thoughts or questions on on the presentations or, or any, any clarification you need. Well, Bill, I think uh, it's being said by some of the participants, we're looking at two different things, two different approaches to inventory resources. And I think what we may need to focus going forward is that the goals, the objectives are going to drive the methodologies. Uh, based on what is it that you want to know, uh, your methodology might, might have to be adjusted. And so for our purposes as a joint venture, I'm looking at both presentations this morning, both methodologies as a way to refine our process, which in many ways is going to be very similar to the GMIT as we move forward in establishing focus areas in South Texas and working with landowners on grasslands improvement in, in South Texas as habitat for grassland birds. Uh, our needs of knowing what's on a specific site 
uh, I'm going to drive the the methodology of the inventory that we want to use is is again very similar to what John is doing because every site is going to have different conditions we will need to get into that site and to the best of our ability be able to inventory what's there and based on that determine what the best conservation management practices are for the objectives that we're trying to accomplish. So, you know, again, maybe uh, as we move forward, just keep in mind that approaches and methodologies will be different according to the objectives at hand. Okay. Um, any, uh, I've, I've got the uh, PowerPoint back up. Uh, uh, can everybody see that okay? Uh, Dave, Lee, are you back? Well, we <laughs> did, um, you didn't oh, give up on us yet, did you? Yeah, um, now that I'm talking, this is Dave. It's, 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 it seems like um, the stuff that John has is really characterizing a tract or an ownership or a, a paddock or something of a pasture. And part of that. Uh, in addition to the management attributes and in addition to the uh, disturbance attributes, there are vegetation attributes. And so Amy's, Amy's form really uh, characterizes the vegetation attributes part of, you know, a tract characterization to me. Yeah. That's how they fit together in my mind. Yeah. Right. Um, yes, what, just, what's uh, the question on those lines, David? Besides there's no reason why, let's say you had access, there's no reason why you couldn't go in and do what Amy's doing in the, within, quote, unquote, a track, right? Right, right. Right. It doesn't have to be roadside. It's not roadside dependent, is it? No, no. not at all. Right. <laughs> Just a quick check with folks. Uh, besides Jaime, was there anyone else new that's joined the group uh, for this last hour? Anybody that hasn't identified themselves? Hey, Bill, this is Charlotte. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, good. I, I, I was having problems with that earlier. I had to dial out and come back in. I think it was some problem with Skype, but I'm on the line. Okay, great, great. And, and feel free if you have a question or comment or you need something clarified to, to speak up. Uh, have you been able to, to view the presentation up till now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, what I'd like to do is just revisit the purpose, what we're here for, the presentations that we've seen, and the next steps. Because uh, the outcome is, is going to be some homework assignments that uh, each agency and organization is going to be asked to uh, to uh, complete. Uh, this this first and foremost effort is to establish uh, inventory and review objectives. You know what what is it that both of those techniques utilize uh, through their goals and objectives that that are the same or what are different. And uh, we want to have you know talk through this because every organization is going to be a little bit different. But I think uh, I think Dave helped summarize it. We're looking at uh, specific plots, vegetation versus tracks, and maybe there's a uh, a hierarchy there that can be built upon. Uh, I think that the two things we're looking at is fine versus coarse uh, filters. Uh, are we after specific species vegetation characteristics, uh, or are we after generalized management, or both? Uh, is it quantitative or is it subjective? I think uh, I think we'll we'll have to uh, uh, determine that. Um, did anybody have a question? If uh, if you're not if you're not speaking, you may want to put it on mute. Uh, Anyway, you just do special. Hey, Amy. Yeah. Yeah. 
Is it you that's not on mute, or who is it, Amity? No, I was on mute. No. But he's on, not yeah, on. Yeah, because you do want to see all your schools on one sheet. Because you can see, like. Are we, uh, I'm getting, uh, I'm getting a lot of garble. Is somebody not on mute? I think what you might want to do is cluster, cluster them on the same page. Hey, Jamie. Hey, Amy. Hey, Amy. I'm just saying. Is uh, is anybody on? Sorry guys, I'm sorry about that. Let me let me okay. mute myself. Thank you. Okay, uh, but uh, you know the uh, the other the other element is uh, identify those required fields that we all have in common, and we've got I've got six seven different varieties of field forms on the table right now in front of us that some of us will look at here locally, uh, and they're. they're they all have very similar elements of both the GMET and Amy's form, uh, and I think trying to develop that drop-down concept with with uh, with key or the highest uh, priority or or interest species might might be a way to look at that. Uh, but again, it's going to be something that each agency and organization is going to have to look at and specify for themselves. And I think this last bullet. Uh, Part of the homework will be identify those inventory items in common that are number one, essential, number two, limited uh, or of limited value and may not be necessary. We don't we don't need to, to develop something that uh, people aren't going to use and, and definitely identify those that you believe are, are not needed. And uh, uh, any, any thoughts from anybody on that uh, on this revisitation of the presentation? So this is Woody. I guess one other point, I guess, uh, that makes the two, uh, and it, it may not make a difference in the end, but, uh, you know, John's approach is really based upon those focal species, trying to collect the information that that is important for those focal species. And then the approach that Amy used is somewhat independent of whatever your, whatever critter you're concerned with. Is that, is that correct? Uh, the way the way I see it, um, this is Dave. There there are things that can be estimated for a pasture or a parcel or an ownership, such as the dispersion of um, of woody species within the entire pasture, or the uh, management of the pasture in terms of grazing pressure, um, and and. There may be some other variables. John could probably chime in, but there are variables that can be estimated for a parcel. And then, it, and then Larry said it best: um, if you're going to actually make estimates of the plant community, the vegetation, um, the attributes or variables have to be collected at a finer resolution. So they have to be tied to a, a geo-reference plot. A smaller plot, like 50 by 50, what it is what Amy did. So you know, you you've got a polygon, and then you've got variables tied to that polygon. The polygon would be an ownership, a big polygon, a parcel, and then you have plots, and then you have a different set of variables tied to those plots. So uh, that's the way I see it. There's kind of two resolutions with variables tied to big plots. And then variables tied to the small plots. Thanks, Jimmy. I think that's a definitely sounds like a uh, a strategy in in in, in progress. But uh, but again, uh, some of us are after qualitative information. Some of us are after quantitative, and there are things that overlap. And uh, and how can we build on that? Uh, and and what what I'd like to do is task uh, representation from from the agencies and organizations there to uh, specifically provide this homework back to us of uh, specific items on the on an inventory sheet and specific specifically defined objectives of what they believe are are uh, uh, the 
focus of their agency or organization's effort. And if we can do that, I think it, it will help us combine to a working group a, uh, a little bit more compatible uh, beta test tube. Uh, the question I had, you know, getting back to this inventory, point versus polygon, site, field, ownership, uh, and Amy, this gets back to you. If, if I mean, you, everything you did was in that that specific uh, unit of inventory. But could that was that easily transferred to to a much larger area that that point fit in? Would someone with with uh, good field skills be able to say this is representative of of a hundred, two hundred acre field. No, nope. I think it could be in certain situations. <laughs> I don't think. No, I know, Dave, from your point of view, I know how you know in the very quantitative sense, but we're not going to have enough people to do that. And, yeah. and if you've got a polygon, a, say a, say a three hundred acre hay field that that someone has identified a point in, can you not characterize that entire? Uh, field or ownership? Well, if, okay, okay. If it's a Bermuda grass pasture, yes. yes. If, it's a, <laughs> if it's a native, um, a fairly uniform, often mowed native hay pasture, maybe close. If it's a more diverse pasture, mm -hmm. different soil types and landforms, what I think you'd want to do, say, Amy's point's only going to take 10 minutes to collect if, when you're on the ground. Right. Just take just take ten of them. Just take ten of them at random, or ten of them that are representative of the 200-acre pasture. That is, that they're on all of the different soil types and landforms within the pasture. Well, I don't think you'd want to just take one in most parcels and say this is characteristic of this parcel. I think you'd want to take, you know, five, or you'd want to take ten. Instead of taking 10 minutes, you'd take 50 minutes or 100 minutes. Right, and if you have the land access, I think it's worth taking the extra time, which is what we did when we had land access for the veg map. Can, can that be streamlined with better spatial characterization, with, with a better land cover uh, product that you have now and with with clearly defined soil characteristics and landform, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, efficiency of scale is what what I'm looking at. You mean streamlined in what to visit on a parcel? Yeah, yeah. I, oh, you absolutely. Know. You could take the vegetation data and target different types or soils and target different types. Yeah. Um. Well, it's just uh, I, I I wanted those thoughts out there with folks because I think there's this whole effort is is how do we get more information about a broader landscape and we're talking about you know uh, millions of acres in the uh, in the uh, Gulf Coast Prairie that we'd like to have at least some defined focal areas with some better information about and, uh, and, well, and you know if you if you've got a cooperator uh, and yeah. you've got access to the land and you want to know the number of clumps Per acre, or the the uh, composition um, height, or whatever. I think you'd get a whole lot better answers taking, you know, five or ten samples of you know 30 acres square, or whatever, than you would in trying to to do that estimate from you know just standing there in one spot and doing the estimate once. I don't think that would be very repeatable. So if you just go ahead and take the time on a cooperator to, to take five or ten samples, I think you'd be a lot right. better off. Right. Or at least uh, come up with with some minimum number that would would be statistically relevant. You know, based on and, and, right. And, and Amy, you're you're doing a fifty by fifty meter block. I mean, that plot, right. It's not really a point as much. Well, as points in the you know sort of in the middle of the plot. We used points just because it was easier in the field. 
um, you could do, if you actually have land access, easily do a 50 by 50 meter plot and walk it, you know. And from from our point of view, this is John again, uh, you know, that's kind of, the, that, that uh, the protocol I think we're working for is this conversation is kind of what we had envisioned for how to make those estimates about a parcel. We didn't ever necessarily think somebody was going to sit in a hundred, a uh, hundred acre pasture and be able to generalize across the whole thing and didn't give any good information. Uh, the idea always was is to, uh, right now, that's how we've collected the data just because, you know, it's proof of concept that for the system or just made it the system. But um, that's kind of what we envision is maybe a standard means of, of sampling that area that's, that's simple and it takes in mind the need to be as 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 non onerous on the data collector as we can because we're trying to get folks that maybe aren't inclined to do this out of the kindness of their heart to, to do this because it makes sense. Um, and and also in our case the the gap between point and polygon is a little easier to make because we have, you know, our guys that are doing these particular projects uh, you know, are, are working hand in hand with the landowner for, you know, to, to meet the landowner's management objectives. So they know, you know, where the pastures, where the fences are. They know how the area is being measured. And, and what you find if you go on enough of these places with these landowners is quite often, and it's actually probably a credit to those, those in our area, those German farmers 100 years ago, but um, quite often the, the pastures follow the soils of the vegetative community. So, right. so you know, you know that this pasture is the brushy pasture. You know that this pasture is the the hay meadow. And if having that sort of knowledge makes it, although hard to standardize, makes it pretty easy for somebody to generalize and stand in one spot or a couple spots and say, hey, this is what this parcel looks like. So, we we're kind of uh, like like I said, it's hard to maybe standardize that approach, but but we're kind of banking on that that ability. I think someone alluded to this earlier. We really need to think about how people are going to use this information because we can go out there and collect as much information as we have time to and characterize these pastures really well, but if nobody needs that really fine scale information, we're just wasting our time. Um, this is Dwayne. I've been sort of listening in and lurking here, but it sounds like we're having an argument on how well you can characterize a 100-acre pasture from one point. And the argument seems to be that, you know, to really do it well, you need multiple points. And the bottom line is, is the further you get from the place you sampled, the more you're guessing. So if you want, if you need a really detailed description of the communities within that and the variability within the, that area, then you're going to need more points. But you're just going to have to understand that the farther you are from your point, the probably the worse, the, the more you are, the less confidence you can have in what that point's telling you about that area. So I think that you need to, we need to say this point describes this area fairly well. And as you get further away from it, there's more uncertainty. Yeah, I, that's a good way to place it. And I think a lot of that has, it's right back to Charlotte's question. There's, there's many situations where we're looking at connectivity and landscape design where we're trying to look at, you know, how, how do four counties fit together in terms of, of quality grassland for, for meeting a habitat objective for a certain species. That's a lot of acreage. And we may want to characterize that with, uh, with some very detailed information and some generalized. So I think it's, uh, we just need to have that vertical integration so we can uh, have a minimum polygon and then work it to, to larger areas. But, but again, it gets back to, you know, what is the objective? And, and I think every, every agency and organization is going to be a little different. Uh, getting back to this uh, concept, I think, I think, uh, we have come to an agreement that, that we can include things that are of value on, on a format like that, be it uh, height or bare ground or uh, bunch grass.
addresses per acre or uh, species, the highest priority or uh, those species that are of uh, most dominant. Uh, and, and I think uh, I think that uh, uh, again we we just need to be we don't need to task people with things that are unnecessary. But uh, I think uh, with some of the some of the efforts with that grassland decision support tool, I would uh, I'm going to speculate, Dave and Lee, that uh, there's going to be some some situations where we want to characterize some uh, fairly large areas of grassland uh, with some type of regimented inventory effort in order to come up with a quantitative uh, estimate of habitat value. That, that makes sense? Yeah, uh, ironically, to characterize a large area, you need a bunch of fine filter samples. Talk about it internally with KPC, but you can count one of us in. Okay. Yeah. I don't know if Marianne's going to want to get Wesley Newman to do it, or or I can do it either way. But I, I think uh, the homework task that you'll get is who who will represent you in the the next phase. Uh, okay. What is your inventory objective, and what do you identify as a specific inventory items? And, and then that's what we'll try and uh, come to closure with, with a uh, refined inventory sheet. Maybe maybe more than what John had, maybe similar to what Amy had with some adjustments. Uh, what, uh, what I wanted to uh, clarify to folks is that the, uh, uh, the staff here in the science team, uh, we've We've got this outline of actions. We intend to integrate this effort with the grasslands pilot as as Dave and, and Pat Comer see fit, uh, and then possibly have a follow-up webinar in December as a progress report to where we're at with this homework assignment today, and then look at possibly future meetings in February and March. And I, I'd like to open this this concept up to uh, to comment right now in uh, open form, if if that will. Any any anybody have comment or question or or you see this as a, as a as a path forward. Hey Bill, I think one of the things maybe that John and I should get together and do is run through the different field inventories together um, and try to incorporate them to sort of get an idea of how they work. Because um, I have not seen how he collects field data. I don't know if John, if you're still there. Um, it might be a sort of way forward in design 
therapy actually run through these protocols? Yeah, I I think we can do that. Uh, I would say even even a step back from that, um, I I'm happy to share what uh, this basically Bill, the next step that you just described is kind of like what what we ended up doing to develop this. Or we we built we actually wrote a document that that showed objectives, attributes, uh, and then and then different. Uh, uh, I guess conditions of those attributes are different qualifying things, like we needed this to be uh, uh, repeatable or blah, 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 uh, polygon, I suppose, to point those things. Um, I, I'm happy to share that document as maybe a, a, a skeleton of what, what others could could put together. To, I mean, what we did was we listed each objective, listed the attributes for it, and kind of a starting place. And, uh, and, like, and, and then, Amy, I agree that we start looking at protocols and try to work towards mm -hmm. it that way and eventually we come up with with the uh, something in the middle. I think that's that's a winning approach. And I'd I'd like to include a few uh key people at, in, in this partnership in that working group to, to work through that with you, John, Amy. Right. Sure. Yeah, this is Cynthia. I think one of the um things on the the time frame bill and you you kind of mentioned this but the science team is getting together in early or mid october sorry so if there are questions that people have there or things we need to address at that time uh we can we can fit that in as well if indeed there are I'm not sure how that lines up really with the homework the homework option but um just another uh, get together to keep in mind it seems to me that one thing that that we well, voice we might be missing in some of this is is people that can speak to some of those other uh, identified LCC focal species that might be associated with grasslands. I don't know what what I mean. Isn't there a gopher, a baku gopher on there? I mean, I don't know what what type of grassland attributes they we need for their habitat. Um, and so you know, identifying people in that science team that can that might have that that know how might be valuable. Yeah, I think I think looking at, uh, at key habitats, uh, I think we I think looking at those pilot areas that we've already identified, you know, mid coast of Texas, possibly the Chenier Plain, uh, North Texas, Oklahoma, uh, we we focus on those areas where uh, both uh, characterization and uh, species of interest are are involved. Again, uh, this is where we identify what, who, and how. And I think you know, uh, each each agency and organization that's on the phone today is going to get a, uh, a homework document uh, with suggested dates and timelines for completion. And uh, and with the idea of uh, let's let's clarify what you believe is essential, limited value, or unneeded in any. Uh, type of uh, uh, inventory, basic inventory that we have in common, and uh, and your point of contact, your, your commitment as an organization point of contact. Um, and we have a commitment from Craig, who's been patiently listening to this, that, that we'll continue to get his uh, spatial support uh, with the uh, Next steps in trying to come up with a platform that we can we can collectively use uh, and share some resources. So, uh, with that, uh, I was going to leave it, uh, Cynthia. Any any uh, further thoughts from you? No, I think this has been. Um I hope everyone else found it useful as well. But I think it's been useful to, to just sit down and talk about these things. And I think the intent to, to get the working group set up and and have a few, uh, you know, future meetings planned as touchstones will help us uh, move this along. So. Dave, uh, leading that grassland decision support team, uh, uh, what's uh, 
Have we, have we painted you another corner you can't get out of? No, I, I think this has been great. I, I really understand what John is doing a lot more after that presentation. That that was really fantastic. Thank you for that, John. And and uh, I just wanted to point out that Woody Woody did correctly say that Amy's Amy's points aren't really points. They're just small plots. And so what Amy and John share in common is that they're they're both describing polygons. John is describing uh, field boundaries or parcels, and Amy is describing, um, you know, small plots, as, as Woody said. And and the the only thing I think that the only distance that Amy and John have to come is John has to be okay with with people collecting information on the actual composition of the dominant species, and Amy has to be okay with collecting four or five additional um, attributes within those small plots that John is interested in. I think we might be able to work something out. But, uh, I, I, think, I think that itself is, is, uh, is progress. So, uh, uh, any and, and Charlotte, I, 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 know, I know where you're coming from on let's not collect information for the select for, for just the sake of collection. Let's uh, let's make sure it's going to be usable and valued for conservation. And uh, many times these are areas that connect the dots between some of our high value sites in order to have that connectivity. That's uh, right now it's so important. For, uh, for a lot of uh, conservation efforts with the fragmentation issues we've got in play. So, uh, uh, anyone else have any comments or, or questions? Uh, if not, uh, you hey, will be getting. Uh, hey, hey, Bill, this is uh, Chris Reed in Louisiana. Sure. Um, I guess one quick comment. Um, well, I guess two comments. One rel relative to the specific methodology um, regarding the the si plot size. Uh, I kind of like the the smaller plots, like uh, Larry and I were talking about yesterday, the, the fifth acre option, since you can actually see 53 feet and you can do stratified sampling on a, on a fairly large site. But anyway, uh, after this. After we work up, uh, kind of come together with a, a final product on the uh, field form and protocol, is this going to be followed with an intensive uh, period of actual field inventory being conducted by the LCC partners? Is, does this tie in with the uh, the pilot projects? What's going to happen after this? Are we actually going to hit the field or, or what? I, you know, I don't want to speak for Dave, but I think there's some elements in that grassland decision support tool, the, the pilot sites that, that will require some some uh, collection of data. Uh, yeah, we, Dave, we, is that? Yeah, we hope to be able to capitalize on the data that's always already been collected by John and by Amy, and then maybe identify um, <coughs> patches where additional data would be very helpful. Um, Instead of trying to sample whole counties, we would be trying to sample, uh, you know, grassland patches, you know, to try to characterize them so that it, you have a better um, handle on where to go sample and it seems more doable. And uh, so hopefully in the future that's, that will require, you know, on-the-ground surveys. Yeah, Chris, from my point of view, um, you know, we've got a number of sites out there throughout the three states that that uh, are high value, high value grassland sites. But we got many, many more acres uh, connecting those sites that we know very little about. And if we want to be effective and efficient in conservation, I think I think it behooves us to find an efficient way. Uh, to uh, look at those connecting dots, how do we how do we 
How do we develop a better connectivity? Because with many of the grassland species that can't fly, uh, that connection is, uh, is very important. And uh, I think that's where we're going next in grassland conservation is how do we develop those minimum polygons sites and, and, and in, in a very strategic way so we're not asking conservation organizations and agencies to go all over the state in every county and collect as much as they can, as quick as they can, and hope that it pieces together. So uh, hopefully that makes some sense for folks. Uh, well, it, would, it would be nice if, the, if what we end up with is something that, you know, what Greg had talked about earlier uh, about generating some, you know, citizen citizen monitoring, citizen science efforts to help us gather more data. That would be that would be pretty primo. Okay. Any any other uh, parting thoughts from anyone? I think I think I've probably said more than enough. If not, I, I, I want to thank everyone for their time this morning and uh, and their input. And it's not over yet. You'll everybody will get some uh, some some additional homework. So yeah, Chris, if if we can give you either stay on or we can uh, we can uh, give you a call later uh, from here. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. We may we may just call you directly so we don't have to uh, man. I, I don't know how long we have this number. So okay. Uh, any other thoughts from anybody? Uh, th this is Woody for for Chris. Uh, if you were able to, the protocols that y'all are using for your you said they were a little more specific and uh, information you know, heavy. But if you could share those, that would be great. Is there anybody from NPAT on the call? Pat Mercord was thought she would be on. Jaime, uh, you're the only one from uh, uh, Katy Prairie Conservancy, uh, Prairie Partners, Coastal Prairie Partners, correct? Yeah, I'm the only. Oh, I'm representing both KPC and Coastal Prairie Partnership today. Yeah. Do you have a copy of the, the data form that NPAT used to do their county surveys? I do. I had to find it. I don't. I I know that Jason Singhurst got me some stuff. It was a while back. But if somebody has it handy, I would love to to have it. One one thing, since Jason and uh, others aren't on the phone, Dave knows this. Uh, there there is a a fairly structured effort to get that information into a standard format. That we mm -hmm. should be able to use soon, Dave. Is that that correct? Yeah, yeah. The, they're working on it, and they're working on uh, priority counties first. Um, supposedly, some of the counties will be done uh, by December. Okay. Mainly, mainly coastal bend counties. So we'll, we'll anxiously await and see what the, how that turns out. And I. I think I do have uh, the document the, um, that NPAT produced um, a little later on in terms of how to collect data. So okay. I can send that to Bill, Bill, if, if you don't have that. Uh, we do have it, and uh, we will probably put a working group together for this uh, effort on the Conservation Planning Atlas, and that will be one document we'll put on there. Okay. May I ask a question about the citizen science component? Um, I've done a lot of citizen science training, and and I know that one of the things that that is a kind of a make it or break it thing for those guys is obviously the complication of the data. And, and uh, we talked about the granularity of the information you're collecting for this effort. Is there was there a discussion about whether a citizen science effort um, would necessarily have to collect as much data as we might want to as professionals or I mean is it scalable such that they can get some valuable data but it might not be as fine a grain as what we all might need to collect if we're going out and formally sampling a place. 
Yeah, I, you know, I'm going to make a stab at this, and, and anybody on the phone can correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the whole philosophy is that everything should be scalable, and I think we need, a, a you know, a rudimentary element. Uh, I had a, a, a long conversation with some of the Park Service folks, and, and, and they, they look at three different levels of uh, inventory. That initial inventory is, is not, not much more uh, specific than, than a good land cover map or a good vegetation map to validate yes or no, is that what it is? And, uh, and then you get into this next level that we're talking about that's a little bit more detailed and then that finer research scale. But, but I, I expect that, that this will help us develop a very, very basic initial entry component that, that's very easy for citizen science. Okay, great. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, other folks. Maybe I don't want to speak out of turn or, or uh, cause issues, but I, I think that's that that's one of the long-term strategies that we see a value here. <laughs> so anyway, we'll we'll wrap that into the the summary as well. Okay. Larry, you had you were going to mention something. Okay, I th I think we're we're done in the room here. Any no other thoughts here? Uh, again, anyone else? Uh, any parting shots? So you will make the webinar, Bill. This is Jaime again. You will make the webinar available so we can review and kind of mull it over. We uh, we recorded it, and what we'll do is post that and we'll have that on our website that you can get access to. We'll probably be able to put it on uh, YouTube. So, Fantastic. That's great. So we will let you know as soon as that's up and ready to go. Okay. Okay. Thank you everybody for for your time today. This was uh this was enjoyable. Oh, thank you.